Thank you so much for your time. I want to be respectful of it and I want to jump into it, but I actually want to go backwards before we go forwards. So, you know, as you know, 2020 hasn't been the year that none of us expected it to be. It's been a lot of different things, a lot of disruptions, a lot of mental battles that a lot of people are facing, especially, you know, in sport where every four years is the Olympic Games. So I want to ask you, Melissa, how did you navigate through last year, the pandemic, you know, dealing with the uncertainty of what the future was going to look like? How did you stay mentally strong? But also I'm going to challenge you to give me a positive from that year as well. For sure. Um, this last year definitely was something that I don't think anybody expected or anybody was prepared for, uh, like you said. Um, with that being said, training and, and kind of coping with the situation was a bit difficult. Um, I had a lot of transitions through coaches. I had to switch up some coaches. I had to switch up facilities. I had to switch up my training altogether. So there were a lot of curveballs kind of thrown at us, but um, I think... I think a positive take from that was just, you know, rolling with the punches, just like you would in a match, just kind of, you know, take them and just deal with it and, and keep moving forward. Don't get too caught up on what's going on in the present and, and the past, especially just kind of focusing on what's in front of you and working towards that. So that's something I would have to say that's a positive from, from this whole year. So how did you, how did you keep yourself mentally in it? Right. Because, you know, a lot of times when something like that happens, even, as athletes, we are aware of, you know, to be adjustable and adaptable to things, but it's not always easy to do that. So what, what, what did it look like from a daily standpoint for you to get yourself up to, well, one, to know where to go and train? Because I think Ontario got hit a little bit harder than most provinces around, around the country. Yes. Um, I, think, I think one thing that really kind of kept me going was the Olympic Games has been a, a dream of mine since I was like eight years old. You know, I watched the yeah. Beijing opening ceremony and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And at the time, I, I'm a karate athlete. Karate was not in the Olympics. It wasn't even yeah. close to being in the Olympics at all. It wasn't even planned for. And that was just something I told myself at a, at a young age that that's the platform or that's the stage I want to be on. And that's the level I want to be at. And I think every day I kind of would think back to those memories from, from when I was a kid. Um, dreaming of these events that that's something that kind of push me forward every day to get out of bed to to do anything really and I have this mentality where if you're gonna do it might as well do it now what's the point of waiting five mm. minutes or ten minutes or, or a whole day and just just kind of get up and do it you're gonna feel tired you're gonna feel sluggish but I know once I get into my warm-up or once I get into my routine those feelings will kind of fall away and I'll feel good and we'll finish up a good session so family of four you know, you have two older sisters and a younger one. Um, you were talking about your mentality of, you know, just go out and do it. <laughs> Before we get into that aspect, what was those summers like, right? Because that's a full house, right? What, what, yeah. what, what was that dynamics like? And I know as we go forward, you know, your, your dad became your coach and was one of your coaches. But what were some things that you remember most growing up and maybe some things that your parents instilled in you? maybe directly or indirectly, because again, you know, all of your siblings uh, are involved in karate from what I understand, which is just crazy. <laughs> yep. Definitely a family business. Um, my parents do own a dojo. That's where I train and that's where I grew up in. You know, that was my place from school to dojo. That was kind of how my life was yeah. really up until the age of 18. Um, so something that I would take away from my parents, especially my dad being my coach is, is the discipline aspect. That's something that he was very, very keen on and very, um, that was something he really drilled into our, into all of our heads. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he was a, a man of his word. So once he said something, we're going to do it. If we're having training at 7 PM, they're training at 7 PM, There's no if or buts, you know? And, um, I don't want to say like, I, I didn't focus on school and other things. Um, those were obviously in the picture. Um, and we had to make sure we had all of those things done yeah. before we had our training. So, um, it really kind of forced you to be very task oriented and get things done on time. Cause if you don't do it at that moment, you know, you're going to be kind of late for everything else after that. And that goes for everything in life. You don't do something today, tomorrow might be impacted because of that. Um, so that's something I would take away from him as, as a coach and as a father as well. So it was around you your whole life. Did you ever feel, did you ever feel pressure to, to do it right? Or did it just come to you naturally? How did you get involved in karate? And when you started doing it, because, you know, sometimes people say, you know, when I started this, I knew this was for me. I knew this is what I wanted to do. 
Now you said since you were young, you had that Olympic dream, but when you actually started, what did that feel like? Did it, did it feel like, man, this is my thing? <laughs> um, I would say that I, I didn't really, I don't remember when I started. I think honestly, I was kicking and punching before I could walk. It, <laughs> it was a family business. Like I said, um, my mom and dad both do martial arts. They started uh-huh. um, in former Yugoslavia back in Europe. And then when they moved to Canada, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. They decided to open up a dojo here and kind of carry on that dream that they had. Um, and my two older sisters were big inspirations for me. We have a huge age gap. I think it's uh, with my older sisters, 13 years and the second oldest is 10 years. So mm-hmm. watching them train and before we had a dojo, I, we actually trained in our basement at home in Mississauga, same home that I, I grew up in. Mm-hmm. Um, we trained there. And so I think I just watching them and being around it so much, I just kind of fell into it along with my little sister. Um, we always kind of say that our parents had two sets of two sets of kids and <laughs> age gap because of the age gap yeah you know they have their own training partners and we were each other's training partners that's kind of how we joke around but I don't think that was the case <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so it was just kind of something that I was born into and I fell in love with it luckily at a young age and it was something that I really enjoyed and it's something that got my energy out for sure um so I, I think that's how I started it wasn't really a set time or date it just kind of happened mm-hmm. So you're immersed in it. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of the, like, I've been watching a lot of karate videos to just try to understand the dynamics of it. And a lot of it, I shouldn't say a lot of it, some of it is very similar to running when I used to run. But before we get into that part, you know, how, obviously your dad was your coach. Yeah. How do you separate the two, right? Because on one hand, hey, you know, you know, he's going to love you unconditionally. But on the other hand, he can probably push you to a level that you may not have been able to reach anybody else because he knows you, mm-hmm. right? So how, how do you navigate those two? How do you know when, like, yo, dad, like, you're going too far here. Like, come on, like, you got to dial it back between, like, yeah. you know, we can go more here. What was that dynamics like? Because I'm sure that had its challenges. For sure. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, our dynamic was pretty interesting um, from, I think, ages, uh, I would say, four to 11, 12, uh, we were very tight. We were, you know, he really pushed me into, into doing what I thought I couldn't do. We met at a young age, mm-hmm. um, whether it was even at the, at the park or at the door at the park, you know, I'd be climbing trees and I'd be scared at the top of the tree. And he'd just be like, come on, keep going, keep going. Just forcing me to do something that's completely out mm-hmm. of my comfort zone. Um, and then my sister would bribe me and give me five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the pushing from him for sure that pushed me to do that kind of stuff. And the same thing applied in the dojo. Um, you know, he, he pushed me at such a young age to do things that other kids were not doing. And when I went to competitions, it really showed. And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of other trainers and, and athletes alike kind of saw me as somebody who was up and coming, even at such a, you know, young age. Um, but I think everything kind of changed when I had the teenage years, you know, you're not as cooperative. I, I think back now, I wasn't the the nicest person. I know, yeah. you know, you're, 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 you wake up from a nap, you don't feel like training, you're a mm-hmm. little... You got a temper going. So we had a lot of clashes on trainings, but that didn't stop us from getting our, to our goals. Things still happened. We still moved forward. Even though there was some bickering back and forth, you know, my sister and I saying, we can't do, we can't do, I'm not doing this. I'm going home and kind of convincing you to continue on with the training and getting things done. So I applaud him for keeping up with us and, and uh, I don't know, cooperating, even though <laughs> he's not cooperative at all. So I, I applaud him for that. Um, but it, it definitely kind of, pushed us to to a new level and um helped us reach goals that we didn't think could even be possible just with us to training as i was watching some some film i watched some of your matches and some others um patience seems to be a big part in it right knowing when to make a move knowing when to kind of dial it back a little bit mm-hmm. are you a patient person by nature like do you, are, you, are you would you classify yourself as a patient person Patience is definitely something I had to learn. Um, uh, coming into the senior career, uh, my senior career, sorry, in the senior field of, of karate, patience is key, like you said. In juniors, you can get away with not being so patient, kind of um, shooting shots that maybe might not sport, score, might score. You don't know what's going to happen and, and things might go through, but in seniors, none of that flies. You have to know exactly what you're doing. You have to know exactly what you're going to throw and you have to know exactly what's going to score. Because if you do that, if you do and you miss, that person will take advantage of that mistake you just made. And, and that's it. One point is a huge uh, 
gap in my sport. You know, if someone has good defense, they score that one point, that's it. You're down. You have, you're, you're tired. You have just wasted a minute and a half of, mm-hmm. of bouncing around and that's it. You, you go home, you pack your bags and you go home. You, all that training and all that uh, effort you took to get there, it goes down the drain with, without the patient. So uh, my earlier matches and in this, my senior career really taught me that that was key. And that's something that I had to focus on when I got home and, and really kind of learn to control myself and my brother-in-law and sister, I I transitioned to them as my coaches. And um, they really taught me that they really taught me to stay composed with myself, not let myself get the best of me. And um, I owe it to them for, for the patients. You know, a lot of times we learn patience when we don't really want it to, right. You know, it's, 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 it's forced upon us. You talked about the transition from um, juniors to seniors. Give me two stories, Melissa, that forced you to grow, right? Like forced you to, to really say, you know, something has to change here, right? Because I think every level that you get, obviously you can be very good, Mm -hmm. but then there's that level of greatness that takes something different, right? Walk me through maybe two stories that you're just like, man, it's going to take something else for me to go in and uncover this so I can elevate to this next level. Because again, you spoke about uh, knowing when, right? Knowing when to make a move, make a shot, but also knowing when that you have to take something seriously or knowing when you have to make a change. Yeah. Were there some matches that, like that for you? Um, yeah, there definitely were a bunch of matches like that. Um, I would say I went through a lot of matches going into my senior career, not understanding why I was losing or why mm-hmm some things weren't working um you know I, I was training my whole life I was like what is like I, I train every day I do multiple trains a day like what's going on like I, I put everything into every training and I get there and I'm losing first round that's how I was for a long time in my senior career it was it was first round and out so you fly to Tokyo you go home you fly to Germany you come home you know put all that time and, and effort into it and, and you don't get a payout so it took a while for me to understand what was going on and um I think I think transitioning from one coach to the other. So when I came home from all those events, my dad and I, again, we, I was a teenager. We were on the greatest terms. Mm-hmm. There was no communication going on. <laughs> Maybe there was communication, but I had my earplugs in, you know, I didn't want to hear anything. And that's just from me being immature and naive and not knowing how to listen. And that was, that was something that I had to learn. And i um, taking a break from my father as a coach and kind of transitioning um, moving out altogether, moving to Aurora, where my sister and brother-in-law live. Um, I moved in with them. They took me in. They took me on as an athlete. Um, them being both former world medalists, um, Saeed Agbani, my coach, and uh, brother-in-law was a Pan Am Games gold medalist. Wow. He unfortunately wasn't able to go to the Olympics because it wasn't in his time at the, uh, when he competed. Mm-hmm. Um, but they took me on and really, and really kind of broke the sport down to me, and they reformed me completely. They said, everything you're doing is not going to cut it in seniors. I had to fix my form. I did six months of just shadow boxing. I didn't touch a glove or a bag. Just in the mirror, just repeating, yeah. repetition, repetition, keeping the elbows tucked in, kind of learning how to control yourself, learning how to control your body and really being your own coach, which is mm. something that was crucial because when you're in the mat and any individual sport, as you know, it's, it's just you. If, if you're not there, that's it. So that was something that I really had to learn. That was one story, I guess, that um, really forced me to change. And another one was this whole COVID situation. Yeah. <laughs> Once COVID happened, um, unfortunately, my, my brother-in-law and sister, they lost their club due to all the restrictions and closures. So um, I had to pull back from them and let them just kind of figure out their own life. And I took it upon myself to give them their space. And I decided to go with the, uh, training alone with my, with my boyfriend and um, teammate. He's uh, actually qualified for the Olympic games. We went to the same qualifier and he pulled through. So it, it was, mm. it was an honor to kind of train with him and, and him showing me his ways and us training together and being a team and, and building off each other and, and just working towards the same goal. So that was another learning experience, kind of just really, really learning yourself. I think that's, that's the takeaway from all that. You know, you talked about your teammate being able to qualify for the Olympics. Um, and it may not have worked out for you this time around. What, what, what do you think about that whole moment having to change all these different things? Because, again, everybody goes through different things, different situations, and they handle it different ways. But 
now that you've actually had some time to kind of sit with a little bit, you know, what are your thoughts on it right now? Because I think, I think as athletes, you know, there's people in general, you can be so hard on yourself that you forget like, Hey, like you actually, there are some moments where you should actually be proud of yourself because you could have stopped when it happened, but you decided to do something different. So as you reflect on what you've been able to accomplish and even being able to get to um, cry trials and championships, what are your thoughts thinking about it right now? Um, sorry, are you, are you speaking about the qualifier that happened and how? Yeah. It took? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, that was definitely a big blow. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think the last three years, I really kind of um, buckled down and really tried to, to put my all in and train in it. And that's this past three years is where I had to train with two different coaches and then leave two coaches and um, as well as stopping school to kind of just pursue this goal of just working towards yeah was his dream and it was just a dream at the time I was one of the youngest athletes on the team nobody really expected me to even try to go for the qualifier or even try to do it because I was 18 at the time when I when I tried it and I was literally the underdog no one paid attention to me about anything I was not on any Olympic program I was not on any Olympic um, funding whatever was going on I was just on the sidelines and I and I understood that I understood I wasn't maybe ready but to me I was I, I believed I could mm. do it I just kind of went for it and kind of getting so close to the to qualifying really it was really heartbreaking not to to push through and I can't blame anybody but myself um I I felt like I fought a good six matches to get to that finals but I wasn't ready I had some something went wrong with the warm-up I wasn't entirely there um Mm. so I lost and that was that and when I came home it was it was hard to realize like everything you just did for three years just kind of felt like it went down the drain and I didn't move from my bed for like a few for a few days <laughs> I was just stuck there I didn't want to eat I don't want to do anything I just was I was like what's the point I just put all everything into into this goal and I didn't achieve it so it took a while to kind of get out of that episode and I had like phases where I would put on the gloves take off the gloves it comes to the facility and I get like right away get to like this dojo or the gym and I just feel like I can't do this I would go home I was trying to get back into it and it took a few weeks for me to finally kind of build up the momentum and, and find a new goal, which is um, the world championships happening in November. And that's, that's it. I'm kind of just, I'm very task oriented. So once you give me a goal, I just work towards it and that's it. If I don't have a task, I fall apart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think a lot of people always talk about getting to the games and getting to these major championships, right. And what it's going to feel like once you get there but I've always found like nobody talks about the other side, Mm -hmm. you know, like, like nobody talks about the fact that you may not make it. It's a whole bunch of people that are trying to get to the same goal, but what if that goal doesn't happen for you on that timing? And so I think it's very important, you know, to understand that the, the, the journey and the process of everything, understanding that who you become along the way, despite if you get to the outcome, that's something that you can always take with you because with with uh with karate with track and field with these amateur sports in the moment man people gonna support you they gonna love you but as soon as it's done they don't remember your name they don't remember this and it's very short-lived yeah but you know and you spoke about it took you some time to get back into you know just mentally being there melissa what does success mean to you right like when when you step away from sport and your time comes to transition and do something else. What does success mean to you? What's your definition of success? That's a tough one. I guess uh, my definition of success is as much as I want to say the outcome, you know, the goal that you set for yourself and achieving that goal, that is success in a way, but I think success is, is the, is the process. It's the journey getting there. And you learn so much about yourself, about the sport, about uh, whatever you're aiming towards. You learn so much on the way that the next time around, when you set yourself another goal, that it'll be a little bit easier in terms of controlling yourself, controlling your emotions, controlling your mentality, not letting yourself get into these episodes where you don't want to move because you didn't achieve what you want to achieve, you know, just constantly learning. And I think that's very important um, for every athlete, for every person It's just, just learn, nonstop learning. It's, it's crucial. How old are you now, Melissa? About 21, 22? Yep, 21, turning 22. You have so much more games left in you. Like your mentality alone 
is going to get you in the position to get there. You know, um, one of the things that, that, uh, that the older cats used to tell me, you know, they used to always say, you know, um, if you aren't patient during the seasons, you're never going to reap the harvest. And I used to be like, yo, what are you talking about? Like, I don't need this. I don't need this, 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 this broken down. Like, I, I just didn't understand at the time. But then what I understood was, you know, the patience that it takes each and every single day and the commitment, right? And the days where you don't feel like doing certain things and you choose to do it anywhere, the days that continues to make the biggest difference moving forward. So, yeah. you know, at the, you got at least three more left in you if you choose to, because it's the mindset and the mentality, right? And yeah. you've already moved on to the world championships, which is just as, you know, it's still a big event. It's still big. When you set a goal for yourself, when you set your mind to do something, on the days where you don't feel like it, maybe you're tired, maybe you know some family stuff is happening, what are some things that you have to do for you to get yourself going, right? People always talk about self-care and this mm -hmm. and that, but self-care looks differently to every person. But yeah. what does that look like for you? What are some things that you have to do for you to get yourself right? Um. I would say on the days that I, you know, if something's going on outside or I don't feel like training, I don't, I don't have the energy for it. I give myself a, a mental checklist almost where as I'm prepping for this training and, you know, I'm getting my, in my head, I'm thinking I have my gear bag, put my stuff in my gear bag. Okay. Check that off. I did one mm -hmm. little step closer to the training or get my water bottle, get my electrolytes, get them ready. Okay. I have that. Now it's another checklist, get my gi going, my, my attire that I wear, have that ready to go. Um, just getting into the car. It's another checklist, right? I'm already driving. I'm already committed to it. Let's go. We're already going to horse training. There's no, there's no reason not to do it anymore. I'm already going. You know, I get to the facility, get changed, another checklist, get my warm up going on slowly. Sometimes I'll feel my my body isn't cooperating. I'm I'm getting into my warm up and it's not it's not warming up. It's not feeling great. My techniques feel heavy. My legs feel heavy. It's it's not great. Just kind of taking into consideration everything that's going on and, and, and going with it again, rolling with the punches. I don't feel that great. Just keep warming up slowly, go for like a longer jog. So we get into the stretch and start nice and easy and work your way up. So that's, that's something I do when I'm not feeling ready for training, not feel like I don't feel like going and just giving myself again, these little goals and tasks in my own head to just keep me going forward, not staying still or going mm -hmm. backwards. So just kind of make that first step out the door, you know, put your foot in the door, whatever the saying is. Yeah. 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 There's a, there's a lot of sports. Um, you look at basketball, you have, you know, you have a team around you, right? Right there in front of you. Football, you have a team around you. Um, a bunch of other, you know, team sports, you have a team. And in karate, you have a team. In, in, in track and field, we had a team, but it's very singular. Mm -hmm. right? your, your team is not on the mat with you. Yeah. What are some things or, or o over the years who are some people that, that, that have really, maybe there was a coach or someone that said something to you that stuck with you because it can be very hard when you're preparing for something and then you get to a match and something may not have went the way that you want it to. That's where your team can kind of help you there, right? Maybe your coach is giving you a cue, maybe something happened, but it's also important to have the right people around you. When you look at team Melissa, what, what, what does that look like for you? right? What are some dynamics that you see, right? Is somebody helping you with the playlist, right? They say, listen, I got the playlist ready for you. Somebody helping you with, with your shoes, whatever the case may be, because in track and field, it was my coach, uh, my therapist. And, you know, that was the squad. That's where we're going to meet, right? So what, what does that team look like for you? Because even though there's people around you can still be lonely and, and, and certain things are amateur sports and funding can be hard and all these different things, but what does team Melissa look like? And what is the importance of actually having the right people around you? Not just a lot of people, but the right people. Yeah. Um, like when you say team, I right away think of my family. Like my family is behind me. I know every match, every tournament, they're there. And that's what they always say. They always say, you know, it doesn't matter what you feel like you're alone on the mat. We're always behind you every step of the way. So they're definitely somebody like, not somebody, they're definitely the people that push me forward and, before every match, for every competition, I always FaceTime uh, my sister and brother-in-law mm. and we have a good talk. We have just a good breakdown, kind of explain how I'm feeling, what's going on. They kind of give me um, 
little mental cues here and there and tell not to worry. It's just the classic. I, I'm a very anxious athlete. <laughs> I deal with a lot of <laughs> a lot of issues when I go to tournaments. Um, I have a lot of stomach issues when I fight. Like nerves really kick in and I tend to like throw up a lot. And that's just my thing. And I'm unfortunately that's something that I just have to deal with. And mm -hmm. it's not so easy on the day of competitions. I can't eat. Um especially with this last qualifier, I think nerves and, and stress really got the best of me where I actually came down with like a fever and um, really bad stomach pains the day before and just calling and talking to my brother-in-law and sister, they were able to kind of calm me down. And after that call, I was able to eat. It's just such mm. a crazy psychological <laughs> thing that happens. And uh, I'm working on it. I'm working with the sports psych and we're trying to kind of get things in order, but um, it's, I've dealt with this since I was the age of 13. So it's, Yeah. It's something that I kind of put into my routine the day mm. of the competition. You know, you're not you're not going to feel the greatest. You're not going to be able to eat. So make sure you eat the day before as much as you can because the day of you're going to be pretty much fasting. So just uh, deal with that. <laughs> But that's a good adjustment right there, though. Yeah, definitely. It's something you just have to, again, roll the punches. Take it as it is and just deal with it. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of other athletes deal with some kind of anxiety and some kind of anxiousness the day of or day before or weeks prior, whatever the case is. And I know I'm not the only one and um, I can't use that as my excuse not to do well. It's just something you have to take and just do and deal with. You know, I think, I think nerves, I think nerves is a good thing, right? Because if you didn't have nerves, you probably don't care about what you're doing. Right. Exactly. So, but being able to harness the nerve and use it to your advantage, you know, when I was at the Olympic games or even in these big track meets, I used to say like, man, am I the only one that's feeling this way? I know that these guys must be feeling it. But what I realized, Melissa, is a lot of times it's a big poker game. Everybody's nervous, but it's the one who can control that the most that really does well in whatever space that they're doing. But the fact that you said, you know, um, I know this now, so now I know to eat more. That is you already trying to correct and handle those nerves. And that is a skill that, you know, not a lot of people be able to do the awareness of it. You talked about nerves and being anxious and, and, and before you go to a match, how do you handle pressure, Melissa? Because as the saying goes, pressure makes diamond, pressure bears perps, you hear all these different things, but there's a method that helps people handle their own pressure. So how do you handle with the pressure of you know, getting yourself up ready for a match? Yeah, um, I would say I do a lot of um, like self-dialogue. I talk to myself a lot. Um, just within myself and um, I kind of have to get myself straight sometimes where I'm, I, I'm succumbing to the, to the pressure and I'm letting it get the best of me and I have to take a step back and be like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> We've been through this before. We know what's going on. You know, this is going to happen and just kind of talk to myself and, and help get myself back into the right uh, gear and, and start just feeling good in the warm up. That's my, that's my biggest um My biggest thing is just getting a good warm up in, feeling good. You know, sometimes I might have to warm up more aggressively and throw a bit more shots, where sometimes you just have to kind of tone it back, throw a couple of shots in, and just go into the match um, just like that. Um, that's another thing I have to learn is not overdoing it. The warm up used to be something where I used to overdo when I was younger, um, pushing really hard and, and, and trying to make up, I don't know, try to make myself feel good for, for no reason when I know I, it's I, all better. I, I, I've been there. <laughs> Exactly. I think a lot of athletes struggle with that too. It's just, just trust yourself, trust the process. You've done it all throughout the trainings. You've done everything. You felt good a week ago. It's not going to change. Seven days is not going to do much. All right. It just, you have to keep yourself uh, and keep everything, your, your stress in, in, um, at the right level, not too much and not too little. Um, so that's something I really have to do before my competitions and, and before I walk into the mat. And um, the first match is usually where I feel the most Mm -hmm. uh stress and those jitters and, and, and the most uh, everything you know but once that for, first match is done then I kind of kick into gear adrenaline kicks in and I rely on the adrenaline a lot once it kicks in then you just kind of <laughs> just everything, roll. everything shuts off and that subconscious comes into place and you can just you just see everything almost in like slow motion it's great <laughs> it, it you know I like what you said there about uh, trusting, you know, the one thing that I always tell people when it comes to pressure, when they feel pressure, it doesn't even have to succumb to just sport, but in a pressure situation, the best thing that you can do is trust your training, mm -hmm. right? Because most people get to a pressure situation and they try and do something different. And when yeah. you try and do something different, it's just not going to work out in your favor. But if you trust what you've been doing, usually, you know, it, it, it goes well, or you are able to handle it a little better. Yeah. You talked about, um, um 
I want to talk about getting ready for something, right? What does that look like for you? Because everybody's different, right? I know you were talking about you as to warm up, warm up, super warm up. Uh, one time I warmed up when I was training and I warmed up too hard, right? But the music was gassing me up and I was getting too excited, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> How important is it, Melissa, especially in a sport as technical as yours, to find what works for you, right? Because you can't succumb to so many different things, but a lot of times the external voices make such a big impact on us, right? So what would you say to someone um, who is trying to find their way of doing something? What are some tips that you would give to them from your experience? For sure. Um, I would just say, honestly, go with what feels right. Um, just feeling everything out and, and seeing what works for you and what doesn't. It's kind of uh, almost like a trial and error kind of thing as you're coming up and as you're uh, really figuring out yourself. Um, I just wanted to say one thing. Like I, I used to think I had to do the exact same warm up for every single event. I was so almost superstitious yeah. in the way where it's like I had to listen to the same song, the same playlist, the same uh, warm up the exact same way to the T with like how many, like the distance I'm covering in, in each jog and, and when I'm pushing up each, each warm up and each technique that I throw first. Um, and then that worked maybe for two tournaments. And I was like, okay, this is maybe my, my routine. And then I kept doing it. And it just, it, it, it almost, I was, I was trying to replicate each other event and how I felt in each event in that new event. And it just was, I was living in the past. It wasn't, mm. um, it wasn't preparing me for that present moment. Yeah. So now what I do is I honestly don't even have a playlist that I listen to. I wake up in the morning and I kind of skim through my playlist and a song will just catch my attention and that'll be my song for the day. <laughs> and that'll be it. I'll stick with that one song. And I kind of like to listen to it on repeat just because it um, provides me some kind of routine in a way. And um, I just kind of go with, with how I warm up usually in my trainings. And if I have to stretch more one leg, I'll stretch one more leg. I don't have to do them the same way. I just want to feel good and, and make myself feel at home when I'm somewhere completely different. So mm. that, that's something I would say is just kind of finding that routine that you do um, daily, but not sticking so strictly to it where you're scared to kind of step out of the boundaries and just, just feel good, feel, feel yourself, feel your body, feel how you feel and, and just go with it. Fine. You're comfortable. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very well said. Uh, last couple questions, uh, Melissa, if there was someone listening and, you know, they, they, they want to get involved in karate or they want to do something, or maybe they're going through a tough time and they're not sure, you know, what words that they need to pick themselves up. What is one advice that you would give to someone who is struggling mentally? You know, maybe the nerves is getting the best of them. Maybe they're afraid to do something. You know, maybe they just need some words of encouragement. What is something that you would tell them um, at this time in their life? Oof. Um, something that I tell myself when I'm, when I'm struggling with, with all of those is you're your best friend. You, you know yourself best, you know, what works for you. Um, you know, what you're working towards, you know, your own goals, you, you know, yourself. Um, and with that being said, only you can really push yourself out of those moments and only you can really, um, help yourself out. Uh, you know, you'll get help from, from external factors and you can always lean on somebody and get them to help you out. But until you realize what you can do and until you realize what you're worth and what um, you're capable of, that's when you'll, you'll make it out. And if you feel scared of doing something, something you just got to jump into it. Mm -hmm. um, something my teammate and I always talk about, it's not about, you know, confidence. I, I feel like is, is an overplayed word, word. We believe that just because, you don't have to have confidence when you're scared to do something. You have to have the courage to do it because mm. you might not want to do things that you want to do. You just kind of have to jump into it and do it and then figure it out as you go. Um, but until you make that first step, it's never going to happen. So I think you just have to kind of jump in and do it. And if you're stuck somewhere and you're in, it's a dark place and you just don't know how to get out, just make any step forward, any, anything you can do, you know, whatever, whatever it may take to just kind of, get you out of bed and sometimes you'll get out of bed and you'll feel like I, I want to go back and it's okay. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Go back. If that's what you need right now, that's what you need right now. Um, but I think it's, it's a, it's a big thing not to look around too much and see what other people are doing and compare yourself to what they're doing and how they deal with their situations and, and how they got through things. I think you just have to feel yourself and feel 
um, what's right for you. And you'll know that once you get there, you'll know that it's, it's not something that has, that can be forced on you. And it's not something mm-hmm. that's going to teach you, unfortunately. Um, I believe that you have to really learn yourself and, and learn what you need and, and how you can deal with things. Ooh, sometimes you don't need, you don't need confidence. You need courage. Come on, Melissa. You're just preaching right now. You're preaching right now. No, that's, 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 that's spot on. I, I, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of things in life that you're going to have to do scared. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take that step anyway, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think too many times we always have an idea of what we expect our plans to be like, but then life is like, nah, we doing yeah. something else. Right. But you have to be receptive enough to understand that life is going to continue moving. We have to adapt. Exactly. Life doesn't adapt. We have to. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well said. <laughs> Last five questions, Melissa. Very easy. Shouldn't be too taxing. Nothing like the previous hard ones that we were doing, right? Sure. First question. If you were about to be trapped on an island for a week, you can only bring three things. What are three things you're bringing, Melissa? Three things. Three things. Um... Trapped on an island. Oof. Definitely my dog. My dog is my go-to. He's been he's been around through everything. <laughs> he's my training partner. Yeah. <laughs> best friend for sure. Um definitely probably like a cheeseburger, like an unloaded amount of cheeseburgers. <laughs> I have my favorite go-to meal. It's my favorite. I'll eat that any time of day, whenever it is. I know I'm supposed to be an athlete. It's supposed to be cheeseburger, clean. extra fries, some lettuce, some yeah. onions on there, yeah. some barbecue sauce. What, what are we doing? Guys. That's my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> but um i one more thing Whew. i'm not sure i'm not sure i guess uh that's a tough one i don't know i'm a very yeah. indecisive person if you can, you can tell <laughs> okay let me help you out Melissa. okay so 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 you, you know you can maybe need a sleeping bag you know to not lay on the sand maybe you need maybe you need a lighter because it's gonna get oh, dark there bug spray bug spray for sure <laughs> I really cannot stand bugs, mosquitoes, flies, any, that's not for me. Any kind of bug, pest control, I need that. That'll be it for sure. <laughs> I can Question. do a system of sand. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Question two, you've obviously had a lot of matches over the years. Um, you've won some championships. What, what is one of your favorite matches to date? Oh, my favorite matches. Um, I would have to say one of my recent ones, actually, uh, at the qualifier, I fought a I fought a girl that I used to compete with as a junior. And the last time we faced off was about three or four years ago um, at a junior uh, World Cup event. And that match was intense, uh, mm-hmm. just being like 16 and 17 at the time. Um, you know, it was like a I was winning by like five nothing. And then she came up by five five and we were at a tie. And then I like last couple of seconds, I got disqualified. And it was a great match. Her coach was so respectful. She was so respectful. Like, I, I really appreciate that in the sport. Um, you don't see that too often with the females. Sometimes the females get a little, um, I would say, aggressive. And mm. They're not as f- close friends off the mat. <laughs> as, <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> yep, so, I get it. Yeah, to see someone like that who was really respectful afterwards. Um, I fought her again this, this event, and um, I think she was – dealing with like a lot of uh, fatigue they were back-to-back matches and it was the first time ever that a karate event was like that we had so many uh, matches back-to-back usually we have about five or six um, and they're spread out this was nine in a day um, so I think I had her like the fourth round so we're both pretty exhausted and we had a great match um, you know there's no bad blood between us afterwards we gave each other a really tight hug um, mm-hmm use my hand when I walked up because she she knew that I had taken you know her out of that qualifier altogether um, but was really respectful her coach gave me a big hug afterwards as well so it was nice to see that um, that much support from from an opponent that you just kind of fought against and when yeah. we fight it if you go all out there's you're gonna hit there's gonna be um, some tension but afterwards just you know everything to subside and be able to give them a hug it was it was a great feeling yeah, this is a question that just came to mind. This is not one of the last three, but how do you, that switch, right? How do you flip that switch, right? From being in fight or flight mode to, okay, this is done. I, yeah. I, I cannot be aggressive anymore. How do you, how do you flip that switch? Yeah, um, I would say it even flips during the match where once you get into that bout where the ref kind of starts the fight, you're all in. You're, this is it. It's, 
um, me against you and I don't care what happens. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to win this match. But then you'll see matches where, where someone's like shin guard will come off and that switch falls up. That turns off right away and you kind of give them a prop. So, okay, we'll restart the match. And you kind of restart the match on your own terms with the coach or the ref stopping you. And that switch comes back on. So how it happens, um, I'm not sure. It just kind of, you, for a second, you come back and you respect the athlete. And that, again, once it comes back on, you still respect them, but you know, you're going to do whatever you can to win. And then again, it switches off and you give them a high five when you walk off the mat. Um, mm. So I'm not sure what happens, how that, how it goes on and off, but you just kind of have to force yourself to get into that all in mode and turn it off when you have to. You, you better than me, Melissa, because once I'm in fight mode, it's, it's <laughs> fighting for the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely have to learn that for sure. <laughs> Question three, what is one movie you can watch every day? Oh man, it has to be Dumb and Dumber. That one is my go-to. <laughs> that is my go-to for every tournament. Um, that and White Chicks. I love White Chicks. It's like one of like the, the funniest movies to me. I know they're the older movies, but they just, they make me laugh and that's all I like to do. And if you can make me laugh, I'm, I'm here to stay. That's how it is. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. What is... Okay, here's one. What is one of the biggest misconceptions about Melissa Braddock? Oh, that's a good one. I think um, I don't have the most, I don't have the friendliest face when I'm just kind of hanging out. Um, it it, it kind of comes off as mean. And I think people become a little intimidated by me and they, they think that I'm rude or um, I'm not going to say the other word, but you know what I'm talking about? And, yes. Uh, <laughs> So I think that's what comes off a lot of times. And um, I think once people get to know me, they they always say they're like, wow, I didn't expect you to be so kind of like outgoing and, and talkative and smiley. And um, I think it just when people see me, it's always in like a training environment or a competition environment or or wherever at a tournament. And I'm just not there to talk. I'm there to do my business and, and do my job and go home. So usually after the competition finishes, I'm I'm way more uh, fun to be around. But or after the training, sorry. Um, but before then I, I come off as a little intimidating, I guess that's, that's what I've been told, but I'm not like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, Melissa, you know, with, with everything that you've been able to accomplish, everything that you've had to endure, everything that you had to overcome, if there was one word to describe you, what would that one word be? And then give me a couple sentences on why. Um, I'd like to describe myself as hardworking, um, and I know it's kind of like a vague term, but um, I'm a person where when I set a goal or a task, I'm going to work to achieve that task and I'm going to do whatever I can to get there. Nobody's behind me. If a whole team's behind me, I'm going to go for it either way. Um, I don't like to rely on anybody for anything. Um, I know that it's going to be me at the end of the day who's going to be at the end of the stick. So you got to go all in. And I'm really appreciative to my team that stands behind me um, and, they, and they push me forward even even at the times where I might seem a little um, isolated or um, kind of in my own head. Um, there, there's a few members or family members and teammates that are always there, even when I kind of become super tunnel vision into what I'm doing. Um, but that, that's something I'd like to describe myself as very hardworking. You know, Melissa, you've, 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 you've already accomplished a bunch of different things, but honestly, you're just getting started. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> your mentality, I'm a front, I'm a firm believer that mentality beats talent every single day of the week, right? Obviously, you have to have some things to work with, but you can also cultivate what you have if you have a strong mind that comes with it. And you have that, right? So it may not have went your way this year, but this won't be the last time that you make an Olympic team. You know, you're, you're going to make a couple of them before your time is up in the sport. So um, I, hope, I hope it hasn't been too discouraging um over the over the past couple of times I, I i understand what it feels like but uh a lot of things in life just because it isn't happening right now doesn't mean that it's not going to happen in the way in the works right so world championships next year gonna be exciting you're gonna finish what you started um but it's also going to be just another addition to what's already going to be a great career moving forward you already accomplished a lot so you, you got so much more to go but um Thank you. Where one thing, karate is only actually in the Olympics. This this event, this uh, what? Yeah, that's Why? like another thing I should say. 
Um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, they had about five tester sports that were kind of thrown in for 2020 or 2021 now. Um, and only four of them actually continued to 2024 in Paris. Um, I'm not sure why Karate didn't go forward with it. It might be something to do with sponsors or I have no idea. I can't say anything. Um, so yeah, that would, that's why there was a huge pressure on this qualifier as well. And that's why so many athletes in the sport came out of retirement and like pushed for, um, for this uh, Olympic event. So it's going to come back. It's going to come back. I hope so. Everyone kind of crossing their fingers that it does come back for maybe 2024 or 2020 Los Angeles. After then, I have to put the gloves. I won't be able to, to fight. <laughs> once uh, once they see how well received it is, it's going to come back. It's going to come I back. Hope, I hope so. Everyone's really praying. <laughs> but so where, where can people keep up with you and your journey? Because, you know, you still got a lot of competition left to go. And again, World Championships in November, you said? Yes. Oh, wait. Oh, that's around the corner. <laughs> yeah. A few months from now, we have Pan Am's. I think are scheduled if they kind of go through with that. It's been kind of all all over the place with COVID and they say events are happening and then they cancel them a few weeks before. So uh, I'm hoping those two go through um, and we are able to compete at them. Um, but yeah, they'll be in October and uh, November. Okay. And okay. World championships. And the best way to keep up with you is, is, is uh, social media. Yeah. Um, right now I'm currently only active on Instagram. I'm, I'm not, crazy with the social media i'm really trying to kind of showcase my journey but um it, it gets a little i when i once i get into a training mode i don't really focus on that in the videos oh, like that. Yeah. So i'm truly really, really trying to kind of show everybody how how training is and hopefully people can kind of get a taste of what it's like to be a martial artist or a karate athlete well melissa thank you so much for your time uh thank you for um, sharing. I know sometimes it can be a little, it can be tough to share certain parts, but uh, I appreciate you. I thank you, and I'm rooting for you and all the best uh, moving forward. Thank you. It was an honor to be uh, interviewed by you, and hopefully uh, we keep in touch. Oh, let's do it. We definitely will, Melissa. For sure. Thank all you. Right. Talk care. soon. Bye bye.